we're a nonprofit advocacy group for the St. John's River. And our mission is to help protect the river. Hello, welcome once again to the St. John's Riverkeeper Show. I'm Jimmy Ort, the Executive Director of St. John's Riverkeeper, and I'm here with my co-host and your St. John's Riverkeeper, <laughs> Hello. Lisa Reinemann. Good to be here. Lisa, it's always good to be on the show again and talk about one of our favorite subjects, the St. John's River. And we will do a lot of that today and probably get tired of hearing us talk about the river, but there's a <laughs> lot to talk not. about. There's a lot to talk about right. the river. Um, first, Lisa, before we get into that, there's probably a lot of viewers out there that don't know who Riverkeeper is and what we do. If you'd give a little bit of background about us, that'd be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, of course, we're a, a nonprofit organization, and it's our job to give the St. John's River a voice. Unfortunately, a lot of decisions that are made that um, hurt the river or protect the river are not made on the river. And so we want to make sure that we're celebrating the St. John's, um, we're advocating on her behalf, and we make it easy for our members and our volunteers to um, advocate and celebrate the river as well. And we are a, a membership-based organization, so if you're not a member of the St. John's, we'd love to bring you on board. You can go to our website at stjohnsriverkeeper.org and hear more about us. But it's focusing on the issues and getting folks understanding, you know, again, fun things to do out on the St. John's, but most importantly, protecting her um, in, in, with every opportunity we can. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. And, and I can't say, uh, you know, emphasize that enough that we are a membership-based group and throughout the show, you know, we'll occasionally show the uh, website up here um, behind us as we're talking. There's a, um, there's a poster that has our website and I would encourage all of you to please go to the website because one, obviously we want you to join, but also there's a lot of information there on our website about the river, about the issues impacting its health, but also ways to get involved. We do a lot of events throughout the year, a lot of outreach events, a lot of community um, festivals and things like that that we participate in. We provide boat trips for the public. We do, actually we have an upcoming two-day boat trip, which is really cool, um, our Eco Heritage boat trips. We do that two times a year. So there's a lot to learn about um, the river, but also a lot of ways to get engaged. And one thing I wanted to mention too, Lisa, is that we also, folks don't realize how much we do on the outreach and education front. Yes. And we have an outreach director, we have an education director, and we have a volunteer coordinator. So we have lots of ways for you to get involved as a volunteer. We, have, we do programs, our education director, goes out and provides programs for schools, develops resources, educational resources for teachers and students and other educators. Um, we do these boat trips and field trips. We have all kinds of fun events, like for instance, we're going to have a Clean Water Act birthday party coming up. It's the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, so we're going to celebrate that and in, in the positive things that have resulted from the Clean Water Act. So the bottom line is, I hope people will get involved, I hope they'll become members, but just get involved with your river. Get out exploring the river, but also in the decisions that are made that affect its future. And that's what we're going to talk about right now, is some of the problems and the issues revol resol uh, revolving the river. Right. One of the first and probably one of the most uh, prominent that people are going to think about is the Silver Springs issue. We talked about it on the last show, but I think it's something that has captured a lot of people's attention throughout the state. So let's start talking about that. and. Give us a little update on where we are with that. Most definitely. You know, Silver Springs, it's a historical, iconic landmark. It was Florida's first um, tourist destination. I remember traveling here years ago from Arkansas to visit the magic that, that we only dreamed of as Florida and to see it in, in, in action. And unfortunately, that our spring, Silver Springs, that landmark is at risk. Um, the flow has dramatically been reduced over 50% um, in the last 50 years, and it's highly polluted. In fact, um, our Department of Environmental Protection just said that to get it back to a healthy state, that current users need to reduce their pollution, their nutrient pollution by almost 80%. So it's quite dramatic. And unfortunately, there's other risk out there. One risk that has galvanized the environmentalist community throughout the state is an application, a consumptive use application, a water use application for a rancher who wants to um, have a, pull a water, lot of water out of the aquifer and have grass-fed beef. And unfortunately, this area, it's in the spring shed. It's very sandy soil. So it's a recipe disaster from a 
water use perspective, pulling water out of the aquifer where it's already overtaxed, as well as the nutrients, the amount of fertilizer, the amount of manure that's going to result from producing the grass, grass to feed the cattle, and of course the products after that. Right. So it's quite uh, a, quite a, a, an issue that's gotten our attention. Um, fortunately, the the applicant has actually reduced their request for the amount of money they want to uh, out of water they want to pull from the aquifer, and they. Well, reduce, it is about money. It is all about money. <laughs> Um, but they're fully, and so they uh, initially asked for 13.2 million gallons of water a day. They reduced that ask, ask to 5.3. And um, while it's a great reduction, it's still a lot of water pulled out of our natural resource, of our water supply system that's already overtaxed. And so we're concerned about the water usage. And they still haven't produced a nutrient management plan. We haven't seen any way um, where they say they're going to try to protect the already very polluted system and um, they're going to protect it from nutrients but there's no plan in place and so we're opposed to the application we're opposed to that use in that space and we want to protect Silver Springs and ultimately the St. John's. Right and as you said I mean it's still a lot of water. A lot of before water. Before we were talking 3.2 million and we've probably talked about it on the show before 3.2 million is more than the entire city of Ocala uses mm -hmm. on a daily basis. 5.3 is still a lot. When you think about it in terms of how much you use individually, we each use, I think the, the average now per, for your residential use is 109 gallons of water a day. So each of us uses 109. This is 5.3 million gallons each and every day that they would pull out of the ground to use to irrigate this property, um, to raise these, these cattle. And it's in an area that, as, we, as Lisa mentioned, 50% flow reduction in the springs, um, and this is not just happening to Silver Springs. A lot of right. our springs have reduced flow, have increased nutrient levels, the nitrates have gone through the roof, mm -hmm. reduced um, uh, bio, fish biomass, like Silver Springs, if, for instance, the fish biomass has decreased by 92%. And I think you said even when you took your kids back recently and looked down, there weren't, it wasn't like what you were looking through those glass bottom boats back when you came when you were right. a child. We literally had to hunt for a fish, and it was quite alarming when I was, you know, again, it was been several years ago, but when I was eight years old and was on Silver Springs, it was like an aquarium. The, the fish life was just amazing, and we literally had to hunt for fish. And the kids got so excited to see a gar, um, but you know it was really it was really saddening for me and, and, and upsetting. And it's not just Silver Springs; it's all of our waters. And if we if we don't protect them, if we don't change our decision making to be more protective, we're failing these natural systems, and they're dying on our watch. And we want to protect that and avoid that, and change the way we respect these natural resources. Well, and you know one thing too that that I think is troubling is that we're in a time when we've actually seen a couple of years ago we actually had negative gro uh, gro uh, growth of population mm -hmm. in the state. We had more people moving out than we're moving in for the first time I think probably in about 50 years. And so we've seen some flat growth in terms of population in our state and yet we are still, this was the time, this was our opportunity to get a handle on water use and how much we're pulling out of the ground and try to prepare for a more sustainable future. We haven't done that. Right. And so what I'm fearful of is that as we grow and populate, more people start moving to the state again, there's more demand on water and we're going to just tax these systems even more. Our aquifer is already stressed, we're already taking more water out than we are replenishing through natural groundwater mm -hmm. recharge. And now's the time to get a handle on that, and we haven't done it. And so we're just going to have more problems in the future, and what's going to result is we're going to be looking to other sources, which is like the St. John's River, right. plans to pull out millions, exactly. hundreds of millions of gallons of water. And we're actually, unfortunately, the leadership of the state is taking us in the wrong direction. You know, and as you said, we have an opportunity right now, while growth has slowed, it's picking up, it's slower than it was, to really learn from our mistakes. I mean, we have made mistakes as a state. We allowed these resources to go so high polluted. We allowed overdevelopment in the recharge areas um, of our precious aquifer. We could change that. We have to make decisions and we have to change law. We have to change policies to protect these natural resources. Unfortunately, the current environment and the current leadership is focusing on job creation. While we, cr we want jobs, but we want the state of Florida to be somewhere people want to move to. When I experienced Silver Springs, you know, many years ago, I knew I wanted to live in Florida someday and be part of this love, wonderful environment that had so many natural resources and eco activities to, for our family to enjoy. But right now, the, the attitude in Tallahassee is let's focus on making it easier for water users, make it easier for industry to pull the water and make it simpler, give them longer permits that are less flexible so we can react as we know more. And uh, the good part of this conversation we're having to protect Silver Springs, it's making us 
cholesterols, we don't have enough science to make the decisions that we're making. And we've got to focus on getting better science and making decisions that are sustainable to protect these resources for future generations. Well, unfortunately, some of the cuts that have been made, which mm -hmm. have been quite dramatic, we, we obviously have probably been on this show before complaining about the water management districts and not, and sometimes at odds, obviously, with some of their decisions, not always completely satisfied with the job that they were doing before. Mm -hmm. But what we don't like is we do support the system, with the water management system, and think that it can operate effectively, but not with a dramatically reduced budgets that we've seen in staffing. The cuts have been dramatic. I mean, across the board cuts at all of the water mm -hmm. management districts. And what has resulted is we have less expertise, less money going into the research and science that you were right. talking about, the monitoring that is so important to see what is the current health situation and status of our waterways, but also whatever we're doing to resolve those problems, how is it working? We don't have the monitoring in place that we did two years ago now exactly. because of the cuts. And so what we're concerned about is while there did need to be some possible reforms made to the water management districts, they have gone, taken us in, um, I think, in, in the wrong direction and it put us in a situation where we, the water management districts, are less able to, to adequately protect our water resources. Right. right. I mean, just recently, the Department of Environmental Protection, they celebrated a million dollars going into the Silver Springs issue. And unfortunately, if you look at the reductions needed, and this is stormwater um, improvements, um, ut utilities improvements, getting septic tanks off the water, focusing with agriculture on um, best management practices, all of those usually get generated with state matching funds. And unfortunately, due to these, these big cuts, those matching funds are gone. And so even if local governments, if local industry, if, if the farmers could come up with their match, there's not the matching dollars that are available due to budget cuts. You mentioned monitoring. The monitoring program, the water quality monitoring program at the St. Johns River Water Management District has been cut 66%. And so now we're getting less data in, um, so we can't react to the unknown. If we don't have the information to know how the, uh, the river is doing, how can we react? How do we know how to invest these limited resources? So it's a big problem. Yeah, and I think that's what we're, we're kind of advocating for now is that one, we need more protective policies. Mm -hmm. We need action, but that's going to require resources. And that's yes. one thing that I think we all have to be mindful of is that we, we, when we invest in our natural resources, it, the return is going to be much greater than the investment. And also, I think in a state like ours, our natural resources are so critical to our economy and quality of life, we cannot, we cannot uh, take a chance of risking the health of these precious resources that contribute so much to what we are all about as a state. And I think that's what we're faced with, is we are literally faced with sacrificing some of these natural resources for the sake of short-term job growth, which I think, honestly, there's no evidence that any of this is generating jobs and what we're doing is potentially putting our water resources at more risk. Right, right. Well, if you look at the current un unemployment rates, I mean, we were actually, it, it's up in Florida right now. These decisions, and there's proof, I mean, there's historical truth. If you look in areas where they've limited regu regulations, especially environmental regulations, it hasn't helped, and especially with a state like Florida. We are known for our beaches. We're known for our springs. We're known for our rivers. We're known for having that interaction with water. That's part of what creates a, a, a competitive advantage for the state of Florida. And if we protect those resources, then people are going to quit having a reason to come here. I mean, in addition to that, you know, we're overtaxing our water supply. And so, yes, it's going to hurt the our natural resources and our environment, but if we continue to overuse our aquifer, there's going to be a point where there's no more to share. There will be no more develop, no opportunities for growth unless we start doing it sustainably, focusing on water conservation and focusing on prevention because we can't buy our way out of this problem. Right, I agree. And, you know, the thing that I always um, have been disappointed is, is the, the uh, there's always been this kind of uh, tendency to try to pit environmental mm -hmm. protection against um, economic growth and we don't they're not mutually exclusive not. I've always said that actually 
they are inextricably linked, that you have to have a healthy environment to have a healthy economy. We can't, they aren't mutually exclusive. And we have to start looking at the value of protecting our natural resources and how that does benefit us economically, but also from a quality of life standpoint, like we've been right. talking about. And I think that's where if we start investing in these incredible assets that we have, that some of them, like the springs, that are so unique to our state that other places just don't have, that those, will, those investments will pay off in spades. And I think that we, now's the time to start recognizing that this is really what we have that um, is so precious and can continue to provide economic benefits to our state for years to come right. if we right. just protect them adequately. And we haven't done that, mm -mm. and I don't think what the direction we're going now is going to accomplish that either. And so that's one of the roles of Riverkeeper is we, make sure, we try to make sure that the, the best interests of the St. John's River and our natural resources are being looked out for. That's our one and only goal and agenda is right. the health and well-being of the St. John's because we believe that a healthy, clean and healthy St. John's River is good for all of us. Um, one of the things that you know you talked about is is the water withdrawal issue and water supply and one and I was just talking recently with some folks about they were saying well gosh we've had all this rain so hasn't this resolved a lot of our water supply problems and won't this restore the health of the springs and the flow that comes from the ground and will you address that? Sure I mean obviously the rain is helpful you know we're so happy to see it those six years of prolonged drought had a huge impact the problem is um, you have very limited recharge areas we have overdevelopments in recharge areas so we're not re the aquifer itself is not getting recharged and we're also using more on a daily basis than it's able to recharge and so we have years and years to make up we're using it too quickly and also is that when it rains really heavily like these heavy rains we've been having you lose a lot of it washes out um, and so you have a lot of that we're, we're not capturing and we're able to capture. Um, like in Duval County, we don't have re recharge areas in this area. And um, in some of the rains, while we may be getting a lot of rain in Duval County, we're not getting as much rain in the recharge areas. So while it's good, it's helpful, we have to focus again on the long term. This may not be a trend that continues. We may get back into a drought and, and, and again, get back into a deficit and focus on that. And we haven't even made up for the lost amount of volume in the aquifer. So while it's helpful, it's good, the main focus is focusing on water conservation. You know, one thing that irritates me more than anything is seeing people running their, um, their, their irrigation systems and it's raining or it's just been raining. I mean, I haven't had mine on all summer. It's been great because we, uh, we can make good choices again and focus on water conservation. Getting water users, you know, this is our water. This is us as citizens, our water in the aquifer. If we're giving it away to industry, have aggressive mandatory water conservation because we can't always rely it's going to be there. And there's a, a very respected scientist, Dr. Bob Knight. He's worked for the water management districts. He's worked with DEP. And in, in his estimations and his models he's looking at, he thinks we've already over allocated what we have available in the aquifer. So even if we were recharging on a healthy basis every day, it's already over allocated. We just don't have what we need. And we have to all be responsible and focus on water conservation, even if it's raining every day. Right, and one of the things too that I think is important to point out is to give people an understanding, the mm -hmm. aquifer, it, it, the Florida aquifer in mm -hmm. particular, that's the name of the aquifer that we get most of our groundwater, or our, our drinking water from in Florida. 90% of Floridians get their water from the Florida aquifer. Now this system goes all the way up into Georgia and the mm -hmm. Carolinas and Alabama. It's a huge aquifer. It's one of the most productive sources of fresh water on the planet. So there are literally, you know, billions of gallons of water in the aquifer system. But so we're not going it's not going to dry up right. and go away. Right. The problem is though as you mentioned is when it's not being recharged. In other words, there's areas where water can quickly get back down into the aquifer. Um, when those areas, when we don't have rainfall in those areas, and we develop those areas mm -hmm. so they're less likely to actually serve as recharge areas to recharge the aquifer, then we're pulling water out faster than we're replenishing right. water. And what's happening in those situations is it results in things like sinkholes, mm -hmm. where we've seen in Central Florida, which is becoming more prevalent, and even over up to the west of us, we saw in Lake City they had some big sinkholes mm -hmm. not too long ago. We have problems with saltwater intrusion. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that over in Cedar Key. They actually had to distribute bottled water to their residents um, not too long ago because of saltwater intrusion into their public drinking water supply into the groundwater. Uh, we've seen that in St. John's County. Farmers right. pumping salt into their, that's 
coming into their um, their wells and they're pumping out, which is not good for crops, obviously. It's not good for crops. In Clay County, I mean, Clay County just recently, a public water supply had saltwater intrusion. We see it right here. There's been a reworking of JEA's wells because they were getting saltwater intrusion to the, e the east of the river. In fact, the big pipeline that a lot of folks um, ran into traffic problems on the Matthews Bridge was built because they were needing to um, provide water over to uh, Arlington from the west side because of saltwater intrusion. So it's, it's happening right here in front of us. So we, we have to be aware of that. In fact, just north of us in Georgia, they put a moratorium on consumptive use permits until they get a better handle and understanding on what's going on. There's been a lot of concerns about shifts in the aquifer and some of the springs drying up um, and you know pulling over taxing and pulling more water in this direction so it's pulling away from the springs and our springs are um, sort of a, a snapshot and a looking glass into the health of our aquifer and when you see our springs drying up when you see that they're polluted the flows are reduced dramatically that shows that the damage we're doing to our aquifer. Right and as you mentioned the aquifer is very important in the springs. It's uh, it, the water that comes up and flows out of the springs is coming from groundwater, from the right. aquifer, but it's also important for the St. John's. We've mentioned this on the show before, like Silver Springs and a lot of the other springs along the river provide 20 to 30 percent of the freshwater flow of the river. So when we have a decreased flow through our springs, we also have less fresh water that's going right. into the St. John's River system that is so important for its health. And what happens is we're not going to necessarily see the river dry up either, mm -hmm. where it's just going to be replaced by salt water, salt water. that mm -hmm. comes in from the ocean and comes farther up into the St. John's, changing essentially the chemistry of the river and um, potentially the health of the river as well because um, of different species like the, uh, for instance, the, uh, the, the eelgrass that's mm -hmm. so important as a as a food source for manatees and other and other aquatic an animals, but also as habitat. It's incredibly important for habitat and for fisheries. And we're seeing a lot of that eelgrass that's dying in the river and moving farther south um, because of the salt water that comes in and it cannot live. Those, those species of grasses cannot live in very high salt conditions. So exactly. it changes and we've got to be mindful of the changes that we do to the groundwater mm -hmm. and how that affects um, surface water. And then also changes that we we make when we alter the river, like from dredging, that well, exactly. can have the same impact. And, and there's two big issues going on, big conversations. One's the water withdrawal, as you mentioned earlier. And typically, you go to surface water withdrawals when you're you don't have adequate you know opportunity in the aquifer. But then the St. John's River already is feeling the pain of the reduced flow of the springs, the reduced flow of the fresh water from the aquifer. Then you start pulling additional water off the surface waters. You're going to start pulling more salt water in from the ocean, so it upsets that chemistry. And you mentioned port dredging. You know, there, um, there is a focus right now, look at dredging um, the channel um, to 50 feet to get larger boats into Jacksport, another job creator, um, which is, is, is important to a lot of people in Northeast Florida. Again, it's, it's important to us. We want to make sure our river is healthy because it's an economic driver. It creates jobs as well. So we can't look at the dredging without looking at its impact on the St. John's. And we know from all the models we've seen, we've talked to S experts at the district, at the Army Corps, independent third-party experts, and there will be an increase in salinity and we have to understand the magnitude of that is it too great is the harm going to be too great to the St. John's and is it cost prohibitive you know yes there's opportunities for mitigation um, and is that something they're going to look at is there on-site mitigation that will work can they do things to decrease the impact or will they just get credit somewhere we don't think that's acceptable if there's going to be the impact it has to be addressed it has to be part of the conversation and we need to look at real ways to, to protect the St. John's and if it's going to hurt it too much and it's going to kill the jobs created by the St. John's we need to have a real conversation about that. Right. Well and also another point I think too is that when we're making these decisions we can't um, look at these, make these decisions in a vacuum. We really do have to look at these, um, the impacts, um, c cumulative impacts, and look at the entire system. When we're taking water out somewhere south um, towards the headwaters of the river, and then we're having also an impact potentially from dredging, and all of these impacts, how do they cumulatively add up to impact the overall health of the St. John's? And unfortunately, a lot of times those decisions are made in isolation because different agencies um, are making those decisions and they're not considering the decisions of other agencies. And so that's one of the things we try to do also, River Keepers, making sure that we're looking at the big picture and the overall health of the river and how, these, how all of these decisions add up 
to, um, of, to affect the St. John's. Another decision that is being made that affects it that sometimes we don't think about in terms of the health of the river is the decision potentially of selling off public lands and how important those lands are to the health of the St. John's in the, in the watershed as well. You exactly. Tell, give us an update on that. There's over 600,000 um, acres of public land that was bought by the Water Management District um, to protect our water resources, to protect the St. John's, to protect the aquifer, and to protect from flood protection. But there's an appetite right now to sell off those low performing properties properties, some that don't have as much conservation value, um, to put them back on the tax rolls. And it's just, it's very concerning because when you look at the modeling, um, there's some areas that, um, there's some that potentially riverfront, some wetland areas, some issue, it places that there was a very deliberate process putting this package of 600,000 acres together to protect the St. John's that they're saying has no value and they're wanting to sell them off. And, and unfortunately, we'll lose the, the value they have, we'll lose that conservation, and it's a slippery slope. If you begin to start selling off these lands that were bought to protect the, in the public interest, then you, you, start, you open a door, and where are you gonna stop? Um, again, we have to protect our conservation lands. The conversation should be having more. Um, one thing I learned through this working with the district on this process is they haven't targeted recharge areas. You know, we talked about recharge areas being so important to the aquifer, and they haven't looked at recharge areas as, as a place to start buying conservation lands. So we should protect the conservation land we have and actually look at buying more in those, those critical recharge areas and other areas to protect the, our rivers and streams. Well, and I worry too, and some of these, I really think that it's a lot easier obviously to quantify things like mm -hmm. jobs and things like that, but quantifying the, the economic benefit or the value of conservation land and what the, what the conservation land provides in services. There's something now called ecosystem services that's becoming more prevalent and, and popular to, um, in, in our discussion about how we evaluate uh, con uh, lands and trees and forests. They provide incredible services to humans that we either have to, we have to try to recreate if nature isn't providing it for us. Like you mentioned, um, stormwater um, uh, filtration, uh, when we have flooding, it prevents flooding. When wetlands, they soak up that water like a sponge and hold it so that we don't have flooding problems in neighborhoods. They provide, obviously, uh, oxygen that we breathe, trees. So there's a lot of these services that either we cannot recreate or that to recreate ourselves um, through infrastructure is extremely right. expensive. And so there's benefits to us also, mm -hmm. but also obvious benefits to the health of the river and the natural mm -hmm. system too. And so we really do have to look at, try to look at all of the benefits that natural lands provide, not only to na the natural system, but also to us as humans. And I think that you know a lot of the, this discussion is unfortunately not focused on that. Uh, prioritizing, really getting a handle on whether we have enough right. land and whether it's uh, what role it's playing, mm -hmm. but more on let's try to get some of these properties off the t off right. of right. Uh, public ownership and onto the tax rolls. It's, it's a short, it's for a short term benefit. They're looking short term when you know, in their opinion, but it's not focusing on long term. And and you know, this is something I have conversations time and time again. The the, the most efficient, cost effective way to protect our resources is to prevent the problem from happening. And as you said, these natural resources they pro provide fil filtration you know they help get the nutrients out they help flood control they if you have these lands in place these natural systems that work the way they should you won't have to build the very expensive systems you won't have to spend millions of dollars on restoration project and so we want to focus on not throwing good money after bad and focusing on preventative measures so we don't have to pay heavily in the end and it's not going to be just us paying it's going to be our kids and their grandkids and we have to pr protect these resources for future generations. Right, exactly. And I think that's one thing that we'll stay on top of. And right. in the, all these issues, you can find out more about on our website. I encourage you to go there. Learn how you can get involved because it really is critical that your voice be heard. We're out there trying to represent the, serve as the voice for the river and represent the river, but we need you to get involved because we need as many people expressing these concerns to our elected officials and letting them know that it is important to protect natural lands and it's important to protect the river. And so we encourage you to get involved. Go to the website, learn more about St. John's Riverkeeper, and hopefully become a member as well. We need you too to make this work possible. Thanks again for watching the show and we'll see you next Next month.
we're a nonprofit advocacy group in St. John's River. And our mission is to help protect the river. 